All right, so in the previous video, we talked about the ER, which is short for endoplasmic reticulum. And now we're going to get on to the Golgi apparatus. Okay, so what we've got when we get out of the rough ER is a very rough protein. So it hasn't really been finished folding. It's, it's not complete. So what's going to happen with the Golgi apparatus? The Golgi apparatus is something that you can think of that's like Federal Express. So when you go into Federal Express, you've got like all your stuff that you want to send somewhere. You just need all the, the boxes and the tape and the labeling and all that, right? So what the Golgi apparatus does is basically that. It's going to modify, package, label your proteins so then they can be sent out of the cell and get sent to the right location, okay? So um, this is going to be the Golgi apparatus right here, that green that you see there, and I have a closer picture here. Now, once again, it's very membranous material, and what's going to happen is these little guys right here are going to be little... Um, kind of like think of them like little bubbles and they're going to have those rough proteins in them from the ER and they're going to fuse with the membrane of the Golgi apparatus to dump the contents in and then they're going to go through the whole Golgi apparatus and they're going to actually get packaged, modified, and labeled and then they're going to come off of the other end of the Golgi apparatus in a new little bubble that they can take somewhere else. So you have what's called the cis face and the transface. The cis face is going to be the receiving side. Transface is the shipping side. So um, I, the way I remember it is C comes before T, right? So it's alphabetical is the way that you can think about it. Okay, so that's the Golgi apparatus. So from there, you could actually have that protein in that little transport vesicle, which are those bubbles I was talking about, and then those can fuse with the cell membrane and dump out the protein. The protein can go wherever it needs to, and now it knows where it's going because it has a little label on it. And when I say label, it's obviously not like the UPS guy is sticking something on there. It's actually going to be like phosphates or something sticking off that's going to trigger a response to get it to the right place. All right, moving on. Lysosomes, those are going to be the next ones. And if we go back to our picture, um, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so your lysosomes are going to be these guys that you see here and here. And the whole job of a lysosome is they have very, very, very low pH within them. Now think about that. If I say low pH, does that mean they're acidic or basic? Hopefully you're thinking acidic. And that means they're going to be able to break stuff down, right? So what they're going to do is, let's say that the cell takes in food, they can actually fuse with that food vacuole and they can digest whatever is in there. Also, they can be used if you have like really, really old organelles and they need to be recycled, they can fuse with those and they can actually um, digest those, break them down to the building blocks, and then the building blocks can be recycled. So that's going to be what lysosomes are for. Um, we'll talk about endocytosis and those types of things um, in a little bit. Now, what's going to happen with these guys, I'm going to actually um, draw this for you, is on the cell, um, whoops, lice, okay, so, oh, this is upside down. I was like, why is everything opposite of what I'm doing? Okie doke. So lysosomes, they're going to be inside the cell, right? So let's say this is our little lysosome. They're going to find an area that has a lot of H plus around it in the cell. And the reason for that is because, remember, these guys, the lysosome themselves, they have a very low pH. And so as they digest stuff, they're going to use up those H plus ions that make it acidic. So they actually need to set up in an area where there's a lot more H plus so that they can pull that H plus into themselves to actually keep the pH at a certain level. So that's why they're going to find that area of the cell. Okay, let's move on to vacuoles. Um, vacuoles are going to kind of be like the storage lockers of a cell. And 
uh, plant cells usually have huge vacuoles, so you can see this big kind of bubble looking thing here. And they can be used for a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, you can have food vacuoles, which are basically going to store food. You can have contractile vacuoles, which are pretty awesome. Um, a lot of protists, like you know things you find, like the little guys that you saw zooming around on your microscope slides, um, some of those will have a, a contractile vacuole. And what happens is they're like this little blob, and they can actually fill up with water Water in their contractile vacuole and then they can contract it and that water is going to shoot out their butt basically and shoot them in the opposite direction so they can get away from predators and stuff. So that's a nice thing to have if you're a protist. And then um, central vacuoles I just showed you in a plant, that can do a whole bunch of stuff. It can store food, it can store toxins, it can store pigments, so um, they're really useful for that. And you've actually um, probably had an encounter with vacuoles and you didn't even realize it. Um, so uh, let me clear this and I can show you what I'm talking about. So um, in onions, right, you have, oh gosh, that wasn't a good choice, was it? <laughs> do, do, do. How do I? Okay, sorry. Um, let's do that and see if that works. Okay, so in an onion cell, you have two vacuoles in it that are actually holding different chemicals. And what happens when you cut through an onion cell, right, you're probably going to do that to them because you're never going to cut perfectly down a cell, or if you do, you're extremely lucky. And what's going to happen is these two chemicals are going to mix with each other. And when they do that, that's going to release that gas that makes you tear, right? And so that's an actual response by the onion to kind of protect itself from you eating it. But of course, us as humans, we're like, oh, that smells great. Let's fry it up in a pan. But in nature, that's kind of the point of having that. And so you've actually had experiences with vacuoles. Um, the next organelle is called mitochondria, and the mitochondria you're going to learn about a lot in a later chapter about respiration. And basically the mitochondria is the reason that we have to ingest glucose and also the reason that we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. So all of that stuff is happening in the mitochondria. They are the powerhouse of the cell, that's where the big stuff is happening, and we call that stuff going on cell respiration. Um, inside of it, it actually kind of looks like a jelly bean. You can see one right here. That's the orange thing that you see there. And inside of it, it actually has another membrane. And that other membrane is kind of all folded up so that you can maximize um, uh, surface area. So you can get as much cell respiration as possible happening in them. So um, like I said, we'll get into that a little bit later, but all along this membrane is going to be that conversion of the, um, you know, oxygen, carbon dioxide, glucose, all of that kind of stuff is going on. All right, next, this is going to be stuff that some cells are going to have and other cells won't, chloroplasts. So chloroplasts are obviously only going to be found in plant cells, and that's going to be where um, photosynthesis is going to happen. So remember those green things in the plant cell that I was showing you before? So there we go. Um, so chloroplasts are going to be these entire things that you see here. And if you look inside of them, they're going to have these things that look like green poker chips, and those are called thylakoids, and they're in stacks that are called grana. Now, um, this is going to be where photosynthesis is going to take place, and the stroma, which is going to be that fluid that's all around all of this stuff, that's actually really important. That's going to help us to make glucose from carbon dioxide. So we'll learn about that in a later chapter, all about photosynthesis as well. I mean, I just keep leaving you with these cliffhangers. I don't know how you can contain yourselves. All right, so then the last organelle is called a peroxisome. Now, peroxisomes are very important because they're used for detoxing. Um, so what they're going to detoxify is going to be fatty acids, alcohol, those types of things. Um, and the reason they're called peroxisomes is because they actually produce hydrogen peroxide as a byproduct of detoxifying different things. So that's going to be all of the organelles. In the next video, we'll talk a little bit more about the cytoskeleton and those types of things.